operator goes with which annihilation operator. But that's something that can be done mechanically. But what caused me the most at the beginning when I, when I started to do that for my PhD was how to draw these diagrams. I wanted to know how to draw them. And then there is something you can always do if you have an interacting term of this type with uh, four operators, two creation and two annihilation. So let's say that our interacting term, is it always occurs in a middle time, in a time t1 in first order, that has to be a time t1 that uh, belongs to the interval minus, uh, sorry, t does t. So it's a time in between the two. And then uh, I know that I want to calculate the single particle Green's function because the single particle Green's function is defined, is defined between t and t does, and it's just a probability amplitude of how the particle propagates from a time t does to time t interacting with the, with the surrounding system. And I want to calculate that and with a middle time t1. So I start putting uh, my operator ck is acting at time t, so I have a ck here, an annihilation operator, and this is my time t. And then I have uh, my initial time t dash, with a creation operator, CK dagger, acting in time T does. Okay? And because I'm in first order of perturbation, I know how can I express that as a Feynman diagram. And one way to do that is, we've seen that at the beginning of the video, is to express, express it like that. Where time uh, now is just uh, in T1, there's only one time because this term is happening at the same time t1. Remember this function in the perturbation. And now I have to differentiate between creation and annihilation. So I, if I say my annihilation operators are here, ck1, ck2, then my creation operators must be here, plus q and ck2 minus q dagger. Okay, and there is a momentum transfer between this and this term. Am I doing it? Yeah. So you have creation and annihilation operator, right? Yes. Okay. So there has to be something you create and something you annihilate. And momentum is passing from one to another, just like that. Okay. There is a losing momentum, there is a passing momentum from one to another. But these are the creation and these are the annihilation. And what do we do now? Well, what we do is to, uh, these are all non-interacting uh, green functions. So this, these lines with the arrows represent these terms here, but with different momentums. And now we have just to match them all together and link them all in all possible combinations we can do. So I'm going to write down a couple of Feynman diagrams in second order because we've seen the first order already, and you, you know how to do that in first order. You should arrive from here to there by just uh, linking the non-interacting Green's functions between them. So let's say, for example, of course you have to link always a creation operator with an annihilation operator, otherwise you don't get that. So the, if, if I put that one here, and I put that one here, sorry, I can't do that because then I see the problem now. So I put that one here, then I have to uh, match this one with this one. Yes, that's one of the possible combinations and that looks very messy, but then you can, of course, simplify and put it like this. Um, you will end up seeing that this is exactly the same as this. Because you load this down, you put that you put that up, and then this weekly line is now passing one middle line between k1 and k2, k2 minus q. But there is another combination you can do, and you will see that if you do that, the only possibility is that uh, you get a creation and annihilation operator in the in the same uh, in the same time. For example, you have ck t. And then you've, you've got uh, this interacting interaction, and you have CK dagger T does. And then you have uh, CK1 and CK1 plus Q dagger, for example. 
and here you have CK2 and CK2 minus Q dagger because the momentum has been transferred from here to there. And now I can use again the fact that this I'm going to uh, match with one of these. For example, if I match these two, okay, the, the T and T dash, and I match this with this, because it's one of the possible combinations, what I have is a non-connected diagram that we talked about before. So this, this is the non-interacting line, uh, G naught K T minus T dash, as it stands, because I'm, I'm just uh, linking this annihilation with this creation operator. And then I have this term outside that is not contributing to this, this uh, it's not crossing this propagating line. And this is a non -con an example of non-connecting diagram. But we've seen that these non-connected diagrams don't contribute to the self-energy. And in fact, they cancel all with the denominator of the S matrix expansion. So we are not considering them. It should be straightforward uh, to derive this uh, hard tree term as a Feynman diagram, because the only thing you have is a function entering here, then you have an interaction with a bubble, and then uh, another Green's function coming out there with the same momentum, and the momentum transfer in this case is zero, of course. So this is the hard tree term. I'm going to draw now uh, second order diagrams, second order, and you can guess that the, the procedure is exactly the same. The, the only difference is that you start uh, with a creation operator, annihilation operator, sorry, at time t, and then you have a cre annihilation creation operator at time t dash, where uh, then you have in the middle some interactions. In this uh, picture, we can now uh, draw different diagrams if we match all the non-interacting lines between them. Remember, you have to match creation and annihilation operators to have non-interacting Green's functions. So one of the possible combinations I can do in this second order is a diagram that is uh, similar to this Fock one, but in the middle there is another Fock diagram, so it has something like that. This is a second order example for a Feynman diagram where you uh, match the non-interacting lines. You have to be careful with the momentum transfer because if you start here with momentum k, you always have to end up with the same momentum k. So in between, there can be some momentum transfers, but you have to be sure that you end up with the same momentum you started with. There is another combination we can do. In fact, in second order, there are too many combinations. One of them is this one. I'm drawing all connected diagrams I'm thinking about because they are the ones that contribute to the self-energy. This is another second order Feynman diagram. And remember that all these lines I'm drawing here, straight lines, are just nothing but non-interacting Green's functions, OK? So g naught k omega, g naught k omega if we are in momentum energy representation. And then the energy has to be conserved as well. So you can start saying, OK, if this, um, this line here carries energy epsilon 1, so now this line here has to carry energy omega minus epsilon 1 because energy has come this way. And then I arrive here, and this carries energy epsilon 2. So then this, this middle line has to be omega minus epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 because an energy has passed here. However, when I come back here, at this point, I recover a epsilon 1. So I have omega minus epsilon 1. And then when I come back here, I recover epsilon 2. So I, I end up with the same energy. That's one way of looking at it. So uh, I'm going to draw more second order diagrams, and I'm going to uh, finish the video with uh, the second order Feynman diagrams. But how do we write them in energy and momentum conservation? Some of them, not all of them, but some of the diagrams I, I like <laughs> in second order of perturbation. Um, the most, the most common one is this one. We've talked about, about it before. It's the bubble diagram. And let's say we start with energy 
omega because this is representing g naught of k omega, a non-interacting Green's function. And then, of course, I have to end up with the with the same energy, so I end up with omega because this propagates from there to there. But I arrive here, and this uh, wiggly line carries energy epsilon one. So that means that this diagram, oh, because because it's propagating like that, this diagram uh, is going to have uh, different energies in this non-interacting Green's function. Of course, if this carries energy epsilon one, this is omega minus epsilon one, and because we can we have to end up with omega, this has to carry epsilon one as well in the down direction. And now this middle one, I'm going to say that it has epsilon two energy, so another Im intermediate energy. And when they end up together, because this has epsilon one and epsilon two, then this up diagram has to need to have energy epsilon one plus epsilon two, because one epsilon one comes here and epsilon two comes there, so this is the sum of both. And then I lose epsilon one here, so I have epsilon two only. So that's one of the uh, most common Feynman diagrams in second order. And now I'm going to draw another one. Uh, we've seen that before. This one. And you're seeing that I'm drawing then in the momentum energy representation because it's the most useful one. Because um, it provides a clearer uh, uh, view of the problem and also because we have that nice expression for for them, we could work in momentum and time as well, but the energy momentum representation is, this is the non-interacting part, uh, the non-interacting Green's function, and we can use that uh, through all the perturbation, uh, all the perturbation calculation. So omega, and this I'm going to call epsilon one, the intermediate energy. So this is carrying omega minus epsilon one, of course. This intermediate energy has epsilon two, and this has, energy epsilon one minus epsilon two. And then here I end up with epsilon one as well. And then because here I have epsilon one and omega minus epsilon one joined to this point, then I end up with omega again. Easy, because then you can express this as a product of non-interacting Green's functions as omega, okay. Well, if you consider momentum, let's just consider the energy and assume that we've integrated over all momentum and then this is G naught omega, G naught of epsilon one, that is the intermediate one, G naught of epsilon two, G naught epsilon one, so actually we have G naught epsilon one squared, and then you end up with G naught omega at the end. Yes, okay, and then a more second order diagrams, we've seen that we can have this one, for example, and all these diagrams contribute to the not to the self energy because I can't split them into two. Another dif different thing will be if we are just evaluating all possible big contractions and we end up with a term like this, for example. That is a second order diagram as well, it's totally valid. So you can end up with something like that and say, okay, I I'm putting that into the self energy. The thing is that this term doesn't contribute to the self-energy because, because I can't split the diagram into two. I just uh, put in a line in between in one of the non-interacting Green's functions. So this term, or terms like this, don't contribute to sigma, the self-energy in Dyson's equation. Okay, uh, we've seen now Feynman diagrams. I don't want to extend anymore because uh, of course, Feynman diagrams is not something easy to learn. It cost me a lot when I started my PhD to understand how to draw these diagrams. But at the end, is is as always, you, you need a bit of hard working on yourself, and you can't just pretend to know everything about Feynman diagrams with one video lecture I'm doing right now. But I just wanted to introduce this um, concept to you because I think it's it's going to be very useful if you are doing many body theory calculations. Moreover, if you are doing perturbation theory, because all perturbative terms can be calculated in terms of uh, Feynman diagrams and everything becomes more uh, easier, easier to, to visualize with these diagrams. So uh, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the video. See you.